good morning to my friends on the West Coast and the Middle West, and good afternoon to my friends on the East Coast. Welcome to the Need Tech Town Hall, preparing frontline healthcare workers for Ebola. My name is Trish Tennell. I'm a nurse at Bellevue Hospital in Manhattan. I'm also our nurse lead for our special pathogens program, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Today, I'll be joined with my colleagues and friends, Dr. Anish Mehta from Emory University, Jill Morgan, a nurse and site manager from Emory University, Vicki Herrera, a laboratorian from Nebraska, and Alex Isakoff, a physician from Emory University. Again, reminding you to give us all your questions. We're ready for you. I'd like to remind people that NEETEC sets and advances the gold standard for special pathogen preparedness and response across the country for healthcare delivery systems with the goals of driving the best practices, closing knowledge gaps, and developing innovative resources. You can see we have three areas of focus, but we recently went up to four. That would be our international division, which gives us best practices from across the world. Our main three are education, consultation, and our research network. All three of these talk with each other. Today, we're with the education doing our webinar today. But we talk, we're able to help, we're able to do on-site and remote visits, we're able to answer your questions, we're able to review any processes that you have. We also have a research network and we're working on getting a specimen repository. So please follow us at newtech.org for further information. I'd like to introduce Dr. Anish Mehta from Emory University, who'll give us an update on the current Sudan Ebola virus outbreak and an overview. Dr. Mehta? Thank you so much, Trish, and welcome everyone. I'm gonna just quickly give an update on the current situation with the data that is known about the uh, Ebola outbreak in the country of Uganda. And this is a specific outbreak of the Sudan strain of Ebola, which is a little bit different than the Zaire strain of Ebola um, that we have more commonly seen in the last several years and importantly caused the outbreak, uh, the West African outbreak that affected the entire world in 2014 through 2016. So with this current outbreak in Uganda of the Sudan Ebola virus, um, on September 20th, the Ministry of Health in Uganda confirmed um, a case uh, with the Sudan Ebola virus causing um, disease in um, the Mamende district of Western Uganda. As of data we have from the Ministry of Health in Uganda on October 14th, uh, the outbreak has now spread to five regions of uh, their country. And you can see the map on the right-hand side. It is still mostly contained within the central and western regions of the country. But of course, the situation uh, is dynamic and likely to change over the next few weeks. The most recent data that we have is 64 confirmed cases of Sudan Ebola, with unfortunately 25 confirmed deaths. Um, of course, in many regions of the country, um, healthcare uh, uh, supplies personnel have been mobilized to try to contain this as much as possible. So really important for all of us in uh, healthcare and in our communities is really understanding um, the risk of spread um, within our communities and particularly through travel. The CDC has issued a level two uh, travel alert for this particular area. And that signifies that international, uh, international spread through travel, is the risk is currently low. We are actively um, looking out for cases and US healthcare workers need to remain vigilant um, about the risk of Sudan Ebola, uh, particularly from uh, patients that may have gone to Uganda and be able to screen patients effectively um, looking for compatible symptoms, exposures, as well as uh, um, obtaining travel history. One of the things that we always like to talk about uh, in NETEC in our education programs is the importance of healthcare facilities' ability to implement good measures for identification, isolation, and informing um, so that we can get early and rapid patient identification 
and be able to take care of those patients effectively while maintaining very good safety uh, for our healthcare workers. Healthcare facilities uh, should um, review their special pathogens preparedness programs. Um, and importantly, if there are any questions or any additional support you need, we have very good structures here within NETEC um, to be able to support those or review them. Um, and we can all work together to make sure that our facilities are well prepared and we, contain, we maintain very good safety for our healthcare workers. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Trish, to talk about some really good ideas for infection prevention and control. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? One of the biggest questions we got, and it has to do with identify, isolate, and inform. Should we be screening all patients? The answer from us is yes. You need to identify. You need to know your point of entry. Remember, they're just not going to walk through your emergency room door. They could be coming through your maternal child health, your labor and, labor and delivery, they could even be coming in for a urology appointment that they scheduled three months before they went on their trip. Remember, you need to check all points of entry. You can post signage for self-identification. Do they have a fever? Have they recently traveled? Have they been exposed to a patient who's reasonably, who's recently traveled, excuse me. So again, screen all your patients. Ask about symptoms. It's tough. It used to be that um, the requirements for identify, isolate, and inform started with travel history, but we're asking that you start with symptoms. Check, do they have a fever? Do they have malaise? Do they have joint pain? That's a differential diagnosis that could go anywhere. It also will give you a clue that they may be infectious. Then take your travel or exposure history. Ask them if they've recently traveled or they've been around somebody that's recently traveled. And if they have positive signs and symptoms, and they've had a recent exposure or travel history, then we move to the next step, isolate. And one of the quickest ways to isolate is ask the patient to don a mask. If they screen positive, use source control, ask them to wear a surgical mask. Then you need to get them into a private room or a private area. Um, sometimes you're unable to get people into a private area that is an airborne isolation room or negative pressure, but get them into a private room. We'd prefer if it had a bathroom, but give them a commode. Make sure that they have a way to communicate outside the room and they should understand to answer the phone if somebody calls in. Limit their contact with other patients, visitors, or healthcare workers. And make sure that if a healthcare worker is going to go into that room, that they are going to don the appropriate PPE and that they're aware to make that they need to doff the PPE correctly. You've isolated your patient. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to inform. You're going to inform the patient about what's happening. You're going to inform the appropriate leadership within your facility and your unit and your organization. And mostly that's your infection prevention and control partners. Then you're going to inform your public health officials, but you're just not gonna call them. You're gonna make sure you go through the appropriate channels. So whether you're using an electronic system to check or you're using a paper screening tool, make sure that you have it. And if you don't have it, Talk to your administration and see why. But please start screening all patients. So now we're going to have a little trash talk. Okay. So one of the questions out of many questions we got is what makes waste from an Ebola PUI or person under investigation different from radical, regular medical waste? So I think we have to talk about what the definition of a PUI is. A PUI, a person who makes the definition of PUI is exhibiting obvious symptoms and they have a positive travel or exposure history. So how is category A waste defined? It's defined by infectious as infectious waste that can cause a permanent disability or life-threatening or fatal disease in an otherwise healthy human or animals when there's exposure from that substance. How's category waste handled? Well, first, and foremost, try to minimize the amount of waste that you generate in a room. So if you have a patient there, I will confess I'm a medical hoarder. 
when I would go in to put an IV in, I'd bring four or five angiocasts. Limit what your staff is going to bring into the room. Remember, everything that is in that room, if the patient rules in, is category A waste. So limit what you're going to put in the room. Train designated staff how to handle category waste. This could be your healthcare workers. This could be your medical waste technicians. This could be your environmental ser service workers. Make sure they know how to handle this waste. Make sure they know what to wear and how to take off the appropriate PPE. So one thing about category A waste, it must be inactivated. And this is either by a saturated steam process or autoclave or by incineration. So for those of you that um, listen to our podcast about viral hemorrhagic fever, Ebola virus is a lipid coated virus, okay? And the best thing about this lipid coating, it's easy to kill. That's why we can kill it with EPA approved disinfectant wipes and by incineration or by inactivation by incineration or by the autoclave. So that's like the best thing about the virus. So it can be killed quite easily. So you need to make sure you have the appropriate waste management in place. If you don't in-house, and let's say you have to take it off site, do you have a place to sequester this waste? This could be, um, I'll just give an example. Ours is a locked area in our basement where we're able to lock the door. We're able to monitor who goes in and out until it can be taken off site for inactivation. So you need to know this ahead of time. You don't want to be running around once you get a patient. The second thing I have to say to you is you can phone a friend. You have partners with all the new tech respects. And you'll see in the chat that there's a link for your regional contacts. And that'll help you giving um, who's at the regional contacts and also um, to Asper and Departments of Health in these areas. Please phone a friend and also the DOT resource. Great resource to use. That'll be up and posted this afternoon when we send up the slides. I'd now like to introduce you to Jill Morgan, a friend and colleague of mine, who's going to be talking about personal protective equipment. Thanks, Trish. All right, so big question about what PPE should we use for Ebola patients? And this is even those you don't know yet are Ebola patients, but you might suspect. So if you have a patient who has a, is exhibiting symptoms of vomiting, diarrhea, bleeding, you want to have full body or total body exposure coverage. So that means that uh, the PPE that you see on the right side of your screen, um, rather, sorry, the left side of your screen, PPE for potential body fluid exposure. This is where you get the impervious layers. So a surgical hood, you want to cover your hair, head and neck, a single use face shield, a respirator, either a N95 or equivalent or a PAPR, powered air purifying respirator, an impervious, impermeable gown or coverall, gloves, at least two pair, the outer of which should be extended cuff, and then a single-use fluid-resistant apron that helps protect that PPE and sure boot covers. If you're in an ER or are performing other tasks where you might be seeing PUIs, people who are stable, people who are not having any of those symptoms, then there is a minimum recommended list of PPE items, which would include a fluid-resistant gown or coverall, a single-use face shield, a face mask, and again, two pairs of gloves, the outer of which should be extended cuff. We do think that a fluid-resistant sleeved apron can provide additional protection to less protective isolation gowns. And I'm going to go to, over that on the next slide. Staff need to be aware of the PPE qualities, the protective qualities of the PPE that are chosen for them to wear. So when we talk about full body coverage, we're talking about coveralls or gowns, shoe and boot covers, and a head cover, hood, or shroud. You're looking for something that meets the ANSI AMI PB70 level four standard for gowns. And for the coveralls, that's the 1670, 1671 standard. That is the only level that assures you that they've been tested against viral penetration. 
for eye protection, we really love the full face shields or goggles that have completely circumferential protection. Respiratory protection, like we said, N95 or higher, or a powered air purifying respirator. If you're using an isolation gown of a lower level, and levels one through three of your isolation gowns, and those, uh, for instance, if you're using a surgical gown, you'll see that on the front of the packaging, will tell you which level it meets, and that has to do with the resistance to fluids. But it's only when you get to the level four that they've been tested against viral transfer. And that's why adding a protective plastic layer like an apron is helpful. Medical or surgical mask and then gloves. What's different about PPE for viral hemorrhagic fevers than what we've been doing for COVID? Perfectly reasonable question. Because the infectious dose of Ebola and many of the other viral hemorrhagic fevers is very, very small, and the amount of virus in these body fluids is very, very large, we do recommend full body coverage PPE when you might be exposed to those fluids. So you need to think about what tasks you're going to perform, how close and prolonged your contact would be, and those potential exposures. We also want staff in PPE to minimize the contamination of their PPE while they're inside and delivering care. Patients' conditions can change really fast. Nobody really comes into you and says, you know what, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to really have uncontrollable diarrhea. That just doesn't happen. So you need to be thinking about what you have in place that can help you deal with those unexpected events. Patients can also present at any point in their illness. And for some people, they may delay presenting because of their concern about being stigmatized or just worry about their condition. The use of a trained observer really should be considered in patients of this type because the margin of error can be so small. So tasks that include verifying your correct donning, observ observation of the staff while they're delivering patient care, collecting specimens, and certainly doffing PPE should be observed by a trained observer. And a trained observer can be anybody who's aware and able to follow your protocols and can watch these staff members either in person or remotely on a video system for these contamination events or to make sure they comply with the steps of your protocol. One of the things that people asked us about before was why we were in such ornate uh, PPE ensembles. And that's because this takes so much time to put on that if a patient has a sudden need, you really just don't have time to respond and maintain patient safety and take the time it needs to put on your PPE uh, ensemble. Not all PPE is amenable to being cleaned while it's in use. So while we think of the one wipe, one swipe, if you're talking about something like a plastic apron, a surgical gown may not be amenable and you may not be able to decontaminate it. So avoiding the contamination of your PPE at, while you're doing these tasks is really important. So regardless of whether you've been really careful or not, when you go to take that PPE off, you need to consider it contaminated and doff with care. And I know that some people have asked about the use of things like a UV light to let you see the contamination. And while that's a great idea for training purposes, when you're in this situation, you can have 10 million copies of a virus, one of these Ebola viruses specifically, in a milliliter of body fluid. And because it only takes about maybe 10 copies to make you sick, your ability to see contamination in these situations would not be enough to make sure that you're not carrying that contamination out of the room. So we don't want to give anybody a false sense of security about being clean. We've put together this matrix uh, and the reference for that will be in the resources section for the different kinds of viral hemorrhagic fevers, not all of which require the kind of PPE we're talking about today. But they all do follow, as Trish said, they're all RNA lipid envelope viruses, and that means cleaning them on surfaces is easy. Doesn't mean killing them inside humans is so easy, but certainly cleaning them from surfaces uh, is much safer than some of the things you guys probably already deal with in your facilities. So we have this matrix available as part of our viral hemorrhagic PPE on NETEC.org. Here are some great resources about PPE. 
First of all, the CDC has updated guidance on viral hemorrhagic PPE. And there's this great new DASH tool, so disaster available supplies in hospitals, that will let you go through what PPE and enter into their format, what PPE you have at your facility, what you would use in these circumstances, choosing your pathogen for how long you might need to be using this PPE, and it helps you figure out your supplies and it helps know when you might need to get supplies from an outside source or your partners in your healthcare coalition. As I said, the PPE guidance for viral hemorrhagic fevers is here, as are the space recommendations for things like donning and doffing. Because while it would be really nice to be able to make just one universal donning or doffing checklist, a lot of the answers about where you do what, whether I take something off in the room or outside, are really dependent on the infrastructure of the spaces you're going to use to care for these patients. Whether you have an anteroom, whether you have negative airspace, how much space you might have within your room to get away from your patient or the risk zone. So it's much more difficult um, than it sounds at first to be able to give you um, clear guidance on any PPE ensemble uh, doffing. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to the next folks. Thanks, Jill. I just want to say I love the DASH tool, and it's something that you should use before you have an incident, and it gives you an idea, really, of what equipment you have and what equipment you're going to need. But I would like to pass it on to my favorite laboratorian, Vicki Herrera from Nebraska, and she'll be giving you laboratory considerations for frontline hospitals. Take it away, right. Thanks, Trish. So big question is what diagnostic testing is even available for this? So as Anisha talked about earlier, there is differences between the Sudan and the Zaire strains of this. Um, current outbreak is, of course, as you know, Sudan and the previous large outbreaks had been associated with the Zaire strain. And though and that is why many of the laboratory diagnostic tests were developed to specifically detect that strain. So federal partners are actively working to increase the testing capacity across the nation for the Sudan strain by deploying assays or testing kits to the public health labs that are part of the laboratory response networks, as well as the regional treatment centers. While they are working as quickly as they can to increase the number of laboratories that are able to test, as of today, that number is still very limited. So the best thing that you can do is to contact your local public health departments and they can help you um, determine what testing is available and where. And if you are part of the LRN network that is not able to provide that test right now and you are receiving phone calls for that, um, please reach out to the CDC as they will have a list of who currently is able to test and will help you determine where those specimens should go. And again, those public health departments or testing facilities will be able to talk you through what specimen types may be needed for you to send to them. Specimen types may vary depending on the laboratory and the test that is available, but currently most of the tests are requiring um, whole blood collected in EDTA or purple top tubes. But again, as the testing increases, there may be other specimens that are requested. So please just contact your public health department or your testing facility. So what happens if you actually do need to um, collect a specimen? Let's say your PUI now meets the criteria for testing. So what are some of those safety considerations? We wanna make sure that both the staff and the patient are as safe as they can be during this process. So prior to entering the room, you wanna do a risk assessment or you want to identify the risks. And then you want to determine how to mitigate these risks or isolate the risks. And then you want to make sure you inform all of the staff of the risks and how you're gonna mitigate them. So again, prior to before you enter that room so that everybody is on the same page and we're keeping everybody as safe as they can be. So just some considerations is, um, do you have the appropriate PPE? So Jill talked extensively about the type of PPE that you may need. So we just wanna make sure that even the lab staff or whoever is gonna be collecting the specimens, that they are familiar with the PPE. Um, and if they are using N95s, remember that they need to have a fit test um, prior to using that to make sure everything fits great. Um, do you have a PPE donning plan? Do you have designated areas and are your staff familiarized with those protocols? Make sure you train on these. 
do you have all the supplies you need? So as they talked about earlier, again, try to gather all those supplies before you enter the room so that you can minimize the amount that's going in. So a checklist is a great thing to make out of all the supplies that you may need before you go in. Um, and then please note that you, I believe most places don't have these anymore, but just in case you have some glass tubes laying around, we really want to collect in plastic tubes just to minimize the risks of breaking any tubes. And then butterfly needles are not recommended. While we know a lot of places like to use those um, for people that are harder sticks, um, there is um, some data showing that we have increased risks of needle sticks associated with those. So if you can avoid butterfly needles, uh, you will be a little bit better off. And then just shipping considerations, do not take the shipping boxes into the patient room. We're gonna package those up, bring them out before we need to ship those. And we'll discuss some shipping in a little bit later. Um, moving on, do you have trained personnel? So who is gonna be collecting your specimens? Is it gonna be a laboratorian? Do you have phlebotomy staff? Is it gonna be nursing staff? So just keep those in mind as to who would be your best person. We're recommending obviously an experienced person. You don't want the newbie going in to collect your specimens. Um, do you need a partner or a trained observer? You might need to assess the situation. It might depend on the acuity of the patient. Is it a pediatric patient that may um, need some extra attention or do you have an agitated patient? Something along that line. So. Looking over that risk before you go in will um, greatly help you assess that situation. Do you have a PPE doffing plan? So again, as Jill talked about your doffing, making sure you have a designated area to doff what you're going to do with the PPE after it's doffed and familiarizing your staff with that protocol. Um, and then finally, what do you do with the laboratory waste? So Trisha talked about laboratory waste. You might wanna sequester it until you have results and sequester it as a category A waste. But ultimately you wanna follow your facility's plans for that, whatever that may be. And you wanna include that laboratory waste in there. Of course, if you do have sharps, which you probably will with collecting specimens, you wanna make sure that you have those in a sharps container so that everybody is as safe as they can be. All right, big questions are, how do you ship these um, specimens? So if you have a suspected Ebola virus, they are gonna be shipped as a category A specimen. It's a category A infectious substance that's affecting humans. Um, at this point, they are not considered a select agent because they are just suspected. You don't know that they actually have um, an Ebola virus or another viral hemorrhagic. So they will be shipped as a category A. Personnel must be trained and certified to ship the category A specimens. The Department of Transportation and International Air Transportation Association have specific regulations on this. So you wanna um, check with your facility or your state public health department about trainings that are available. There are online trainings, but you wanna make sure that you have somebody in your facility that is able to ship or that you have somebody that can help you do that shipping. Another big thing is identifying your couriers. Um, just because they are a category A does not mean that every courier will take a category A. So couriers have different requirements. The more conversations that you can have prior to needing the, um, the courier, the better off you are going to be. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, and the other options are, do you have the option for a ground courier? This may depend on where you need to do the testing. Is your testing facility in the same city? Is it in the next state? Is it you know, a city nearby? So looking into the possibilities of different ground couriers is something that you should check ahead of time. Again, states may have different requirements on this. So having these conversations ahead of time will greatly expedite your shipping. All right, um, do you have the correct shipping supplies? So there are special requirements for, cat, for boxes when you're shipping category A, and also the conditions that you need to ship them in. Do they need to go um, with an ice pack? Do they need to go dry ice? Can they go room temperature? There are different boxes to accommodate those different shipping requirements. So just making sure that you have the correct boxes and the appropriate packing material. And then what days can you ship? 
is your courier available seven days a week? Are they only there Monday through Friday? How about your testing facility? Can your testing facility take specimens seven days a week or are there requirements on that too? So checking into those things prior to getting a patient will greatly help um, your preparedness. What kind of testing could you actually do at your own facility? Are you able to do any routine testing? So routine testing has been done and it's been done successfully and safely on patients with a special pathogen. But I just wanna point out that communication is key. The more conversations you can have with everyone from your physicians to your nurses, your lab staff, your leadership, all of your different players, the more prepared and safe you will be to help keep your staff and your patients safe. So just a few little steps. You want to look into risk mitigation, which is identifying your risks, um, or sorry, risk assessment, which is identifying your risk, risk mitigation. Um, you want to implement what your findings are. So how are you going to mitigate those risks? And you want to inform your staff on this, and then you want to continue to do ongoing assessments. There's lots of laboratory considerations when you're looking into doing routine testing. These are just a few of them. So I'm just gonna read quickly. And then we have a blog post on the NETEC website that talks about this and has a lot more links so that you can look and keep in mind that we're always available to help you too. So, you know, does your patient just need a quick glucose or some electrolytes? So just looking into that, what kind of point of test um, in testing is available at your facility. Um, what are the risks involved with this instrument? How many instruments do you have? You know, could one be dedicated to a patient for a period of time? Can you take that kind of out of service and dedicate it to that patient? Where will you be doing the testing? Is it going to be in the room? Do you have a separate space that you could do some laboratory testing? And do you even have trained staff that are available to do this testing? you know, should a patient come in? And then how will you clean and disinfect your instrument? Again, these are a lot of questions, some things for you to look at if you need to do testing at your facility. Um, we are here to help and happy to answer any questions. Please reach out to us if you need some extra help. But in the sake of time, then I'm gonna pass it on over to Alex. Uh, so I'm Alex Isaacov, an emergency medicine and EMS physician and uh, NETEC's lead uh, for their EMS work group. Uh, we're going to talk about considerations for the EMS community and transport of patients. As we know, the EMS community are frontline healthcare personnel that could encounter a patient uh, suspected to have Ebola virus disease um, in the front lines as they work uh, in the 911 system, um, or also potentially for an interfacility transfer. So we've already heard the importance of identify, isolate, and inform. And this is important for the EMS community, too. Um, the EMS community needs to uh, recognize which countries in which there is an Ebola outbreak um, currently in Uganda and have some understanding about the signs and symptoms uh, of the illness. Um, the early signs and symptoms of the illness are fairly nonspecific. Uh, it could be just fever. It could be just muscle aches and pains, then kind of leading into uh, some pretty significant uh, GI signs and symptoms. And then patients will you know, get sicker and potentially get septic and, um, and even die. But the early signs and symptoms of the illness are pretty nonspecific. And so it's really that exposure history, that travel history, that's critically important uh, for frontline healthcare personnel to be aware of. And currently, um, this outbreak is uh, limited to Uganda. Um, this type of screening for the EMS community could happen at the call taker's desk or in the uh, emergency medical dispatch center. Uh, it can also happen uh, by field personnel making patient contact. And so um, making field personnel uh, and then implementing uh, procedures at a call center where a travel history uh, can be discerned and the signs and symptoms that are concerning for Ebola virus disease um, having awareness about those in those areas uh, can help increase our chances of identifying somebody in our community who's had the appropriate travel history, signs and symptoms that raises concern they may have Ebola virus disease. If we have concern, then we need to isolate uh, the patient, meaning implement a hierarchy of controls uh, to decrease the likelihood or prevent 
a chance of getting exposed to their infectious bodily fluids. And we'll talk about some of those. They include in, uh, environmental or engineering controls, administrative policies and work practices, and use of uh, personal protective ensembles. And the underlying goal is prevent our personnel uh, from getting exposed to infectious bodily fluids and implement processes that decrease uh, the chance of getting exposed to uh, bodily fluids at all. Then there's a need to inform others. We know that, uh, especially in our 911 system, there are often multiple responders uh, coming to the uh, responding to the needs of the patient. And so, if through the course of your history you start to have suspicion that this person has the right travel history, the right signs and symptoms concerning free Ebola virus disease, um, it's important to let other responders know so that you can prevent unprotected exposure to the patient. Um, have a way to contact uh, your local and state public health authority. Um, whether that's through your chain of command or otherwise, uh, many jurisdictions uh, may have additional resources or assets that they can um, bring to the scene, like uh, dedicated um, transport teams, uh, teams that have the necessary competencies, efficiencies, and equipment uh, to safely uh, care for and transport that patient. And if you do find yourself with need to transport the patient to receiving facility, please call in advance and let them know that you suspect this patient might have Ebola virus disease because of the travel history and their signs and symptoms. So with regards to engineering controls, I mean, these are designed to decrease the likelihood of you uh, coming into contact with um, an infectious bodily fluid or anyone else that were to enter the uh, ambulance afterwards. And so we make recommendations for separating the driver compartment from the patient compartment so that if there is um, uh, uh, dissemination of infectious bodily fluids in the patient compartment. It's really limited there, and uh, the driver compartment can be considered clean. Um, we do uh, recommend draping the interior of the ambulance to protect its environmental services, especially uh, in cases where there's risk or the patient's already proven that they will that they uh, can uh, vomit or have diarrhea or have a uh, a large um, um, sort of infectious uh, bodily fluids spill on the back of the ambulance to make it more easy to uh, clean and disinfect the ambulance. Adjust air handling to introduce fresh air into both compartments and turn the exhaust fan on high in the back of the ambulance in the patient compartment. We think there's value in uh, source control, trying to prevent the patient from uh, sharing infectious bodily fluids with responding personnel. So as you're familiar with uh, in COVID, apply a surgical mask to the patient, um, apply uh, an impervious suit if it's tolerated or an impervious sheet. Imagine that this patient may have already had diarrhea or had vomited uh, or has saliva, which can be infectious and have contaminated their clothing. Um, we think it best to try and uh, use barrier uh, protection to prevent exposure to um, those infectious bodily fluids that may be on the patient's skin or clothing. Um, if the patient's having profound diarrhea, consider having an undergarment uh, available so that that can be collected. Um, consider having a leak-proof container uh, in case the patient has need to vomit. And uh, consider uh, treating the patient for nausea really to prevent emesis. Um, so long as your scope of practice uh, allows for it. It's even uh, reasonable to consider, given the scope of practice, to uh, uh, to consider some sublingual uh, antiemetic like Zofran be available rather than have need to start an IV if there's no other need to do that but to manage their nausea. Obviously, for personnel, uh, avoid unprotected exposure by letting the other responders know about the concern that you have that the patient might have uh, Ebola virus disease. Limit the exposure to the minimum number of personnel that are required to take care of the patient. Uh, remember that uh, Ebola virus disease is largely transmitted through direct contact or indirect contact with infectious bodily fluids as well as droplets. And so there's value in that six, off, six foot standoff distance um, when uh, in, interacting with the patient if you don't need to be closer um, or if other personnel don't need to be closer. You can apply the six foot rule to try and get some protection from heavy droplets. And we've always recommended that the driver of the ambulance not make patient contact uh, so that the front of the ambulance is always considered clean. In terms of clinical care, um, we're always careful with sharps, but if you have uh, suspicion 
uh, that the patient has Ebola virus disease, uh, limit use of sharps um, unless they're absolutely necessary, uh, limit aerosol generating procedures if possible. Um, be prepared to resuscitate the patient. Uh, it, I think it's important to know that um, there are a number of conditions that can present um, that a patient that's traveled to Africa can present with that may look like Ebola, but is not Ebola. So coming from uh, the African continent and then presenting with fever um, or uh, nausea, vomiting or myalgias uh, could as easily be malaria as it could be Ebola virus disease. So we need to be prepared to manage the needs of the patient, even when they're in Ebola PUI. Um, and so uh, knowing what appropriate infection prevention measures um, are and how they can be implemented is really critically important for EMS who would have need to uh, to manage the needs of the patient. And um, I believe this is important both for 911 responders as, as it is for uh, EMS agencies that are doing interfacility transport. Um, you do need to have a plan for um, if the patient is deteriorating um, or if you were to have a loss of vital signs. Um, many EMS agencies might divert uh, from the intended destination to the nearest, the nearest community hospital. And uh, we don't think that it's good practice to take a um, uh, patient confirmed with uh, Ebola virus disease to a hospital that's not prepared to manage them. So um, those plans need to be reviewed as well. Uh, my friend, Joe Morgan, already described uh, PPE. And, uh, and in the EMS community, we use PPE similar to what's being used in the in-hospital setting for all the reasons that Jill mentioned. And I won't go uh, into the details of that again, but what we're doing is implementing standard plus contact plus drop of precautions and are prepared uh, with air implementation of airborne precautions should an aerosol generating procedure be uh, needed. And in this case, we're using typically an impermeable uh, coverall, um, a full face shield with an N95 respirator, but many teams selecting uh, the use of a powered air purifying respirator instead double gloves, boot covers, um, and then uh, many EMS agencies have adopted an, an apron. Um, there is a provision uh, for stable persons uh, under investigation, stable meaning stable vitus lines, no vomiting or diarrhea, perhaps somebody who's just returned from a country uh, with an Ebola outbreak like Uganda today and then develops fever. Um, in this case, uh, a fluid resistant gown or coverall full face shield with a simple surgical mask and double gloves could be appropriate. And depending on um, the uh, risk that the individual actually was exposed uh, to Ebola virus disease um, and the condition of the patient and the number of PUIs that you may have need to transport in your community, uh, use of that PPE ensemble is much less of a burden on EMS personnel, and uh, you should uh, consider when you might use that instead of the PPE ensemble that's recommended for unstable PUIs, meaning those with vomiting, diarrhea, um, and those with confirmed Ebola virus disease. Um, all of these PPE ensembles, uh, you know, among other stressors, uh, make it more difficult to communicate with patients and with teammates, and so it's important to consider communications we also know that wearing a coverall, uh, depending on ambient temperature and humidity and where you work in this country, um, can certainly be a cause for thermal stress, which is another um, important thing to consider. So as has already been mentioned, um, uh, EPA-registered hospital-grade disinfectants are important um, for uh, cleaning and disinfection of environmental surfaces. Um, and uh, all the waste that's generated from the uh, care of a patient um, confirmed with Ebola virus disease um, or of a PUI until uh, the disease is ruled in or ruled out uh, needs to be managed as category A waste, which um, as had been previously mentioned is highly regulated. And it may be best practice for EMS agencies um, to leave that waste with the receiving facility uh, because receiving facilities will uh, most often have uh, procedures in place for management of highly regulated waste. Um, and so uh, this is a practice that uh, many agencies that we work with uh, among the regional special pathogens treatment centers um, have implemented. Post-mission surveillance is important for the EMS personnel. 
it's recommended that personnel that have had uh, potential exposure to infectious bodily fluids or the patient uh, be observed for signs and symptoms of illness for one incubation cycle. Uh, for Ebola virus disease, an incubation cycle is 21 days, um, or until the disease of concern is ruled out. And so it's possible that you transport a PUI, a person under investigation for Ebola virus disease, who ultimately proves to have something else like malaria and not Ebola. Um, under those circumstances, the 21-day observation period uh, can end. But if the patient proves to have Ebola virus disease, then observation for signs and symptoms of illness is important um, to uh, to uh, identify uh, responding personnel who may have uh, unknowingly been exposed to infectious bodily fluids and then contracted the illness. This procedure is often coordinated with uh, your local or state public health authority. It's important to remember um, that asymptomatic people uh, are not contagious. I just wanted to provide uh, some links uh, for resources. Uh, here are two resource documents that are hosted on the CDC website. Um, these are familiar uh, to many of you uh, that have looked up these resources from uh, the 2014 through 2016 Ebola um, uh, outbreak uh, that we were preparing for here in the U.S., um, and uh, so interim guidance for EMS uh, 911 call centers and uh, response agencies, as well as guidance for developing a plan for interfacility transport um, are available on the website. With the assistance of Asper Tracy, uh, there is an EMS infectious disease playbook that was uh, developed and published uh, shortly after the last Ebola virus disease outbreak. Um, it has good information about how to implement a hierarchy of controls for patients uh, that are PUIs or confirmed to have Ebola virus disease, as well as um, presenting information around uh, standard and transmission-based precautions um, and hierarchy of controls uh, as needed for other special pathogens. Please consider checking out our resources on the NEETEC website. There are resources for frontline healthcare personnel as well as for EMS personnel, and there are opportunities on the website to submit um, additional questions to NETEC subject matter experts. With that, Trish, I'm turning it back to you. So here we are, question and answer period. And we're going to start off with our first question. And um, I'm going to toss it to Dr. Anish Mehta. And the question is, Anish, what is the likelihood of a patient presenting with multiple infections, examples like malaria, COVID-19, and Ebola? This is a really important question for people that are providing care for individuals that may have risk for Ebola or another special pathogen. When particularly patients uh, that have risk due to travel, it is more likely that they have some other disease process than Ebola. And so it's important that while we are very quickly, if, if we believe that they have some risk for Ebola, that we're getting that testing done, that we have ways of caring for the patient for other disease processes they may have. What we learned in 2014 and 15 for patients that we were ruling out for Ebola is that they're more likely to have influenza, to have malaria or other travel related or more common things like sepsis and what we see commonly in the US still today, COVID. So it's really important that we're able to initiate care for all the things that they might have while we're effectively and safely evaluating them for Ebola. And oh, to add to that question, can they have multiple infections? Yes, they can have, and we've seen this with uh, all of these types of infections, you can be concurrently infected with flu and a special pathogen that can occur. And so it is good to evaluate your patient for um, all infections that they may be at risk for. Thank you so much, Anish. I really appreciate that. So the next question, I'm going to Toss over to Jill. Are you ready? Always. If a, P if a PUI or confirmed Ebola patient is able to use a, the private bathroom, does staff need to disinfect waste, i.e. pour bleach down the toilet prior to flushing? It's a great question and it's complicated as many things are. This is not a question we can answer for you at the national level because your public health and your municipal water people are going to have something to say about this. It's a great time to have those conversations now and know what your options will be for the use of toilets in your facility if you were to have a patient, uh, a PUI or a confirmed patient. The other people you definitely want involved in that conversation would be your IPC team and your maintenance crew because 
even if your public health people feel okay about it, and many do, your people who have to handle your plumbing fixtures may not. And you want to make sure that you've addressed all those concerns. Many facilities within NETEC use some form of chemical disinfection in a toilet letting there be a sufficient dwell time for that disinfectant, and then a double flush before pre-treating it again. But that, again, is very much determined by your own public health and water municipal water authority. Sorry. Yeah, I would also say check with your unions. All right. I'm going to take this next question. And this question is, is it recommended that a nurse or MD stay in the room with a patient for a period of time an example being one to two hours to minimize donning and doffing, or is it recommended to be in a room as minimal amount of time as possible? So I think one of the factors that I would look at, how critical is the patient and do you need to be in the room that long? If a patient is clinically stable and we always want to remember the patient in the bed, if the patient's clinically stable and doesn't re require a great amount of care, Somebody may not have to stay in the bed, the room with the patient once two hours. If the patient's critical, then it's probably best that they stay inside the room because remember the easiest way, um, the easiest way to uh, get contaminated is through the doffing process. Sorry, I apologize. Somebody just sent me something. So I think it depends on how critical the patient is and what needs to be done in the room. So Jill, you brought up a question about, can you just transfer the patients? Do you wanna answer that? Yeah, so I know that it is just as, as a former, I was gonna say old ER nurse, I'm probably both a former and an old ER nurse. Um, it's really tempting to say, can't we just move these patients somewhere else? And of course, you still are obligated to provide a screening exam. So that means you have to have some idea and plan in place. And while right now um, flights from involved areas, known involved areas are being directed to five US airports and that puts special obligations on the cities uh, you know, that those airports are in. We also know that this outbreak um, is a little concerning and that there are some cases that we haven't been able to do all the contact tracing for, and therefore people may have gone home to other countries. Uh, and so I think that being cautious is certainly what we are recommending, that you screen for symptoms and travel at all points of entry. And then the idea of transferring a patient, you really still have EMTALA, right? Everybody knows that you have to have a screening exam. You have to make sure that that patient's stable. And you want to know what care you would be able to provide in case a patient were to be ill. Um, could you put in a simple IV? Maybe you'd know that you wouldn't do a central line, but could somebody put in a peripheral? What are you able to do safely at your facility with the PPE and the supplies you have? And we get it. This is not easy. I would guess most facilities across the country are dealing with a huge transition in the staff and the staffing they have. Um, we're all making do with, with what we have and uh, we recognize that this is a difficult time to add another thing to your plate. But what's in the best interest of the patient and safest for your staff is for you to go ahead and get prepared now, make sure people know how to access their PPE, what PPE they need to use. And as Vicki mentioned, what would you be able to offer a patient if in fact they presented to your facility? before you decide to throw them in one of Alex's wrapped ambulances. Thanks. Thank you, Jill. So I am going to ask Nish to help me answer this question. Um, and this question is, do we quarantine all staff who cared for a rule out Ebola patient until we receive an Ebola test result? If positive, do all staff stay quarantined from work or family for 21 days? I'm going to give the answer what we would do here at Bellevue, and then Anish, I'll let you talk about Emory. So at Bellevue, even if the patient rules in positive, they don't have to be quarantined unless they've had an exposure. All right. They're able to go back up, work on the floor, do their regular thing. Um, some people did prefer to, when we had our patient back in 2014, to stay at the hospital 
They felt they didn't want to be around their families. So always have a place for them. But by the second day of sleeping on a cot, they all went home. So Anish, you want to hit, hit the rest up? Yeah, thanks, Trish. So uh, to, I'll start out to st what I think is the most important uh, point is that local context is really important. And so really understanding what is required and needed by not only your healthcare facility, but your local and state public health authorities and, and be in communication with them if any of these events occur on how to keep your healthcare uh, workers safe and also how to keep your uh, community safe. But the principle that Trish mentioned is exactly what we use here is that if our uh, healthcare workers are wearing appropriate PPE and we've not had any breach or known exposure, then they are free to go on about their work. They're going on about their life as they um, would normally do with appropriate monitoring from our occupational health um, professionals. We do that in coordination again with our, our local and state uh, health departments to make sure that they understand who we're monitoring and why we're monitoring them but this allows us to continue the care for all of our patients in our hospital and continue the sustainable um, uh, personnel resources that we all have. Thank you so much. My gosh, that hour went so fast. Any questions that weren't answered, don't worry. We're going to get them answered. We're going to get you. Need Tech Resources, please contact us at info at needtech.org. Even if you have questions that you didn't want to ask in the chat or you went at home and you just said, oh my God, what do I do with the food tray? I must ask Needtech, send it. We'll be right there. Submit a technical assistance to needtech.org. Let's say you want us to look at your protocol or maybe help you a little bit in deciding where you're going to put your zones. Just send it to us. We've got the experts here to help you. Remember, we're on Facebook. We're on the Twitter. We have our own blog now. We're on Instagram. And I always forget what that other one is. Use the hashtag Hashtag NeedTech to contact us. Remember, we have podcasts, Transmission Interrupted. We're on YouTube, and we still have courses that you're able to get CEUs for at our NeedTech eLearning Center. And we have a repository for anything you may need. And please, please, please email us. Phone a friend. We're here for you. Thank you all so much for attending. Have a great day and continue being prepared. Thank you so much. <laughs>